Leviathan, or the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Of the power of councils to make the scripture law. That which may seem to give the New Testament, in respect of those that have embraced Christian doctrine, the force of laws, and the times, and places of persecution. Is the decrees they made amongst themselves in their synods. For we read, Acts 15.28, the style of the council of the apostles, the elders, and the whole church, in this manner, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost, and to us. To lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, and see, which is a style that signifieth a power to lay a burden on them that had received their doctrine. Now to lay a burden on another, seemeth the same that to oblige, and therefore the acts of that council were laws to the then Christians. Nevertheless, there were no more laws than are these other precepts, repent, be baptized, keep the commandments, believe the gospel, come unto me, sell all that thou hast, give it to the poor, and follow me, which are not commands, but invitations and callings of men to Christianity, like that of a save 55.1. Ho, oh, every man that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, come, and buy wine and milk without money. For first, the apostle's power was no other than that of our Savior. To invite men to embrace the kingdom of God, which they themselves acknowledge for a kingdom, not present, but to come, and they that have no kingdom, can make no loss. And secondly, if their acts of counsel were laws, they could not without sin be disobeyed. But we read not anywhere, that they who received not the doctrine of Christ, did therein sin, but that they died in their sins. That is, that their sins against the laws to which they owed obedience, were not pardoned. And those laws were the laws of nature, and the civil laws of the state, whereto every Christian man had by pact submitted himself. And therefore by the burthen, which the apostles might lay on such as they had converted, are not to be understood laws, but conditions proposed to those that sought salvation, which they might accept, or refuse at their own peril, without a new sin, though not without the hazard of being condemned, and excluded out of the kingdom of God for their sins past. And therefore of infidels, s. John saith not, the wrath of God shall come upon them, but the wrath of God remaineth upon them, and not that they shall be condemned but that they are condemned already. John 3.36, 3.18 Nor can it be conceived that the benefit of faith is remission of sins unless we conceive withal that the damage of infidelity is the retention of the same sins. But to what end is it, may some man ask, that the apostles and other pastors of the church, after their time, should meet together to agree upon what doctrine should be taught? both for faith and manners, if no man were obliged to observe their decrees? To this may be answered, that the apostles and elders of that council were obliged even by their entrance into it, to teach the doctrine therein concluded, and decreed to be taught, so far forth. As no precedent law, to which they were obliged to yield obedience, was to the contrary, but not that all other Christians should be obliged to observe, what they taught. For though they might deliberate what each of them should teach, yet they could not deliberate what others should do, unless their assembly had had a legislative power, which none could have but civil sovereigns. For though God be the sovereign of all the world, we are not bound to take for his law whatsoever is propounded by every man in his name, nor anything contrary to the civil law, which God hath expressly commanded us to obey. Seeing then the acts of counsel of the apostles were then no laws, but counsels, much less are laws the acts of any other doctors or councils since, if assembled without the authority of the civil sovereign. And consequently, the books of the New Testament, the most perfect rules of Christian doctrine, could not be made laws by any other authority than that of kings or sovereign assemblies. The first council that made the scriptures we now have, canon, is not extant. For that collection the first bishop of Rome after S. Peter is subject to question. For though the canonical books be there reckoned up, yet these words, sit vobis omnibus clericis and lysis libris venerandi, etc., contain a distinction of clergy and laity that was not in use so near St. Peter's time. The first counsel for settling the canonical scripture that is extant is that of Laodicea, can. 59, 
which forbids the reading of other books than those in the churches, which is a mandate that is not addressed to every Christian, but to those only that had authority to read any publicly in the church, that is, to ecclesiastics only, of the right of constituting ecclesiastical officers in the time of the apostles. Of ecclesiastical officers in the time of the apostles, some were magisterial, some ministerial. Magisterial were the offices of preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God to infidels, of administering the sacraments and divine service, and of teaching the rules of faith and manners to those that were converted. Ministerial was the office of deacons, that is, of them that were appointed to the administration of the secular necessities of the church at such time as they lived upon a common stock of money, raised out of the voluntary contributions of the faithful. Amongst the officers magisterial, the first and principal were the apostles, whereof there were at first but twelve, and these were chosen and constituted by our Savior himself. And their office was not only to preach, teach, and baptize, but also to be martyrs, witnesses of our Savior's resurrection. This testimony was the specifical and essential mark, whereby the apostleship was distinguished from other magistracy ecclesiastical. As being necessary for an apostle, either to have seen our Savior after his resurrection, or to have conversed with him before, and seen his works, and other arguments of his divinity, whereby they might be taken for sufficient witnesses. And therefore at the election of a new apostle in the place of Judas Iscariot, S. Peter Seth, Acts 1.21, 22, of these men that have company with us, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us. Must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? Where, by this word must, is implied a necessary property of an apostle, to have accompanied with the first and prime apostles in the time that our Savior manifested himself in the flesh. Matthias made apostle by the congregation. The first apostle, of those which were not constituted by Christ in the time he was upon the earth, was Matthias, chosen in this manner. There were assembled together in Jerusalem about 120 Christians, Acts 1.15. These appointed two, Joseph the Just, and Matthias, ver. 23, and caused lots to be drawn, and ver. 26, the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the apostles. So that here we see the ordination of this apostle, was the act of the congregation, and not of St. Peter, nor of the eleven. Otherwise, then as members of the assembly, Paul and Barnabas made apostles by the church of Antioch. After him, there was never any other apostle ordained, but Paul and Barnabas, which was done, as we read Acts 13.1, 2, 3, in this manner. There were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menin, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered unto the Lord, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted, and prayed, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. By which it is manifest, that though they were called by the Holy Ghost, their calling was declared unto them, and their mission authorized by the particular church of Antioch. And that this their calling was to the apostleship, is apparent by that, that they are both called, Acts 14.14, Apostles. And that it was by virtue of this act of the church of Antioch, that they were apostles, S. Paul declareth plainly, Rom. 1.1, And that he useth the word, which the Holy Ghost used at his calling, for he styleth himself, an apostle separated unto the gospel of God. Alluding to the words of the Holy Ghost, separate me Barnabas and Saul, etc., but seeing the work of an apostle, was to be a witness of the resurrection of Christ, and man may here ask, How s? Paul that conversed not with our Savior before his passion, could know he was risen. To which it is easily answered, that our Savior himself appeared to him in the way to Damascus, from heaven, after his ascension, and chose him for a vessel to bear his name before the Gentiles, and kings, and children of Israel. And consequently, having seen the Lord after his passion, was a competent witness of his resurrection, and as for Barnabas, he was a disciple before the Passion. It is therefore evident that Paul and Barnabas were apostles, and yet chosen and authorized not by the first apostles alone, but by the Church of Antioch.
as Matthias was chosen and authorized by the Church of Jerusalem. What offices in the Church are magisterial? Bishop, a word formed in our language, out of the Greek episcopus, signifieth an overseer or superintendent of any business, and particularly a pastor or shepherd. And thence by metaphor was taken, not only amongst the Jews that were originally shepherds, but also amongst the heathen, to signify the office of a king, or any other ruler or guide of people, whether he ruled by laws or doctrine. And so the apostles were the first Christian bishops instituted by Christ himself, in which since the apostleship of Judas is called, Acts 1.20, is bishopric. And afterwards, when there were constituted elders in the Christian churches, with charge to guide Christ's flock by their doctrine and advice, these elders were also called bishops. Timothy was an elder, which word elder, in the New Testament is a name of office, as well as of age winky face yet he was also a bishop. And bishops were then content with the title of elders. Nay s. John himself, the apostle beloved of our Lord, beginneth his second epistle with these words, the elder to the elect lady, by which it is evident that bishop, pastor, elder, doctor, that is to say, teacher, were but so many diverse names of the same office in the time of the apostles. For there was then no government by coercion, but only by doctrine and persuading. The kingdom of God was yet to come, in a new world, so that there could be no authority to compel in any church, till the commonwealth had embraced the Christian faith. And consequently no diversity of authority, though there were diversity of employments. Besides these magisterial employments in the church, namely apostles, bishops, elders, pastors, and doctors, whose calling was to proclaim Christ to the Jews and infidels, and to direct and teach those that believed we read in the New Testament of no other. For by the names of evangelists and prophets is not signified any office, but several gifts, by which several men were profitable to the church. As evangelists, by writing the life and acts of our Savior, such as were S. Matthew and S. John Apostles and S. Mark and S. Luke Disciples, and whosoever else wrote of that subject, as S. Thomas and S. Barnabas are said to have done. Though the church have not received the books that have gone under their names and as prophets, by the gift of interpreting the Old Testament, and sometimes by declaring their special revelations to the church. For neither these gifts, nor the gifts of languages, nor the gift of casting out devils, or of curing other diseases, nor anything else did make an officer in the church, save only the due calling and election to the charge of teaching. Ordination of Teachers as the apostles, Matthias, Paul, and Barnabas, were not made by our Savior himself, but were elected by the church, that is, by the assembly of Christians. Namely, Matthias by the church of Jerusalem, and Paul, and Barnabas by the church of Antioch. So were also the presbyters, and pastors in other cities, elected by the churches of those cities. For proof whereof, let us consider, first, how s. Paul proceeded in the ordination of presbyters in the cities where he had converted men to the Christian faith. Immediately after he and Barnabas had received their apostleship, we read, Acts 14.23, that they ordained elders in every church, which at first sight may be taken for an argument that they themselves chose and gave them their authority. But if we consider the origin all text, it will be manifest that they were authorized and chosen by the assembly of the Christians of each city. For the words there are, Cairo Denesentes auto express buterus cataclesion, that is, when they had ordained them elders by the holding up of hands in every congregation. Now it is well enough known that in all those cities, the manner of choosing magistrates and officers was by plurality of suffrages. And, because the ordinary way of distinguishing the affirmative votes from the negatives was by holding up of hands to ordain an officer in any of the cities, was no more but to bring the people together to elect them by plurality of votes, whether it were by plurality of elevated hands, or by plurality of voices, or plurality of balls, or beans, or small stones, of which every man cast in one, into a vessel marked for the affirmative or negative, for diverse cities had diverse customs in that point. It was therefore the assembly that elected their own elders. The apostles were only presidents of the assembly to call them together for such election, and to pronounce them elected, and to give them the benediction, which now is called consecration. 
And for this cause they that were presidents of the assemblies, as in the absence of the apostles, the elders were, were called proestotes, and in Latin antistides. Which words signify the principal person of the assembly, whose office was to number the votes, and to declare thereby who was chosen. And where the votes were equal, to decide the matter in question, by adding his own, which is the office of a president in council. And, because all the churches had their presbyters ordained in the same manner, where the word is constitute, as Titus 1.5, Inicatastes is cata pollen presbyteris. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest constitute elders in every city, we are to understand the same thing. Namely, that he should call the faithful together, and ordain them presbyters by plurality of suffrages. It had been a strange thing, if in a town, where men perhaps had never seen any magistrate otherwise chosen than by an assembly, those of the town becoming Christians, should so much as have thought on any other way of election of their teachers, and guides, that is to say, of their presbyters, otherwise called bishops, than this of plurality of suffrages. Intimated by S. Paul, Acts 14.23, in the word Chirodonescentes. Nor was there ever any choosing of bishops, before the emperors found it necessary to regulate them in order to the keeping of the peace amongst them. But by the assemblies of the Christians in every several town. The same is also confirmed by the continual practice even to this day, in the election of the bishops of Rome. For if the bishop of any place had the right of choosing another, to the succession of the pastoral office, in any city, at such time as he went from thence, to plant the same in another place. Much more had he had the right, to appoint his successor in that place, in which he last resided and died, and we find not, that ever any bishop of Rome appointed his successor. For they were a long time chosen by the people, as we may see by the sedition raised about the election, between Damascus and Ursinicus. Which Ammianus Marcellinus Seth was so great, that Juventus the prefect, unable to keep the peace between them, was forced to go out of the cities. And that there were above an hundred men found dead upon that occasion in the church itself. And though they afterwards were chosen, first, by the whole clergy of Rome, and afterwards by the cardinals, yet never any was appointed to the succession by his predecessor. If therefore they pretended no right to appoint their successors, I think I may reasonably conclude, they had no right to appoint the new power. Which none could take from the church to bestow on them, but such as had a lawful authority, not only to teach, but to command the church, sent Peter and John to them, by imposition. They that were baptized, verse 15, received, which before by the baptism of Philip they had not received, the Holy Ghost. For it was necessary for the conferring of the Holy Ghost, that their baptism should be administered, or confirmed by a minister of the word, not by a minister of the church. And therefore to confirm the baptism of those that Philip the deacon had baptized, the apostles sent out of their own number from Jerusalem to Samaria, Peter, and John, who conferred on them that before were but baptized, those graces that were signs of the Holy Spirit, which at that time did accompany all true believers. Which what they were may be understood by that which s. Mark Seth Chap. 16.17 these signs follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This to do was it that Philip could not give. But the apostles could, and, as appears by this place, effectually did to every man that truly believed, and was by a minister of Christ himself baptized. Which power either Christ's ministers in this age cannot confer, or else there are very few true believers, or Christ hath very few ministers. And how chosen what? That the first deacons were chosen, not by the apostles, but by a congregation of the disciples, that is, of Christian men of all sorts, is manifest out of Acts 6. Where we read that the twelve, after the number of disciples was multiplied, called them together, and having told them, that it was not fit that the apostles should leave the word of God. And serve tables, said unto them, verse 3. Brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, and of wisdom. Whom we may appoint over this business. Here it is manifest, that though the apostles declared them elected, yet the congregation chose them. Which also, verse the fifth, is more expressly said, where it is written, that the saying pleased the multitude, and they chose seven, etc. 
of ecclesiastical revenue under the law of Moses. Under the Old Testament, the tribe of Levi were only capable of the priesthood and other inferior offices of the church. The land was divided amongst the other tribes, Levi accepted, which by the subdivision of the tribe of Joseph into Ephraim and Manasses were still twelve. To the tribe of Levi were assigned certain cities for their habitation, with the suburbs for their cattle. But for their portion, they were to have the tenth of the fruits of the land of their brethren. Again, the priests for their maintenance had the tenth of that tenth, together with part of the oblations and sacrifices. For God had said to Aaron, Num. 18. 20. Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part amongst them, I am thy part, and thine inheritance amongst the children of Israel, for God being then king. And having constituted the tribe of Levi to be his public ministers, he allowed them for their maintenance, the public revenue, that is to say, the part that God had reserved to himself, which were tithes and offerings, and that it is which is meant, where God saith, I am thine inheritance. And therefore to the Levites might not unfitly be attributed the name of clergy from Kleros, which signifieth lot, or inheritance, not that they were heirs of the kingdom of God, more than other. But that God's inheritance was their maintenance. Now seeing in this time God himself was their king, and Moses, Aaron, and the succeeding high priests were his lieutenants. It is manifest that the right of tithes and offerings was constituted by the civil power. After their rejection of God and the demand of a king, they enjoyed still the same revenue. But the right thereof was derived from that, that the kings did never take it from them, for the public revenue was at the disposing of him that was the public person. And that, till the captivity, was the king. And again, after the return from the captivity, they paid their tithes as before to the priest. Hitherto therefore church livings were determined by the civil sovereign. In our Savior's time, and after. Of the maintenance of our Savior and his apostles, we read only they had a purse, which was carried by Judas Iscariot. And that of the apostles, such as were fishermen, did sometimes use their trade. And that when our Savior sent the twelve apostles to preach, he forbade them to carry gold and silver and brass in their purses, for that the workman is worthy of his hire. Matt. 10, 9, 10. By which it is probable, their ordinary maintenance was not unsuitable to their employment, for their employment was ver. 8. Freely to give, because they had freely received, and their maintenance was the free gift of those that believed the good tiding they carried about of the coming of the Messiah their Savior. To which we may add a, that which was contributed out of gratitude, by such as our Savior had healed of diseases, of which are mentioned certain women, Luke 8. 2. 3 which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna the wife of Chuzza, Herod Stewart, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. After our Savior's ascension, the Christians of every city lived in common, Acts 4. 34. Upon the money which was made of the sale of their lands and possessions, and laid down at the feet of the apostles, of goodwill, not of duty. For, whilst the land remained, saith S. Peter to Ananias Acts 5.4. Was it not thine? And after it was sold, was it not in thy power? Which sheweth he needed not to have saved his land, nor his money by lying, as not being bound to contribute anything at all, unless he had pleased. And as in the time of the apostles, so also all the time downward, till after Constantine the Great, we shall find that the maintenance of the bishops and pastors of the Christian church was nothing but the voluntary contribution of them that had embraced their doctrine. There was yet no mention of tithes. But such was in the time of Constantine, and his sons, the affection of Christians to their pastors. As Ammianus Marcellinus Seth, describing the sedition of Damasus and Ursinicus about the bishopric, that it was worth their contention. And that the bishops of those times by the liberality of their flock, and especially of matrons, lived splendidly, were carried in coaches, and sumptuous in their fare and apparel. The ministers of the gospel lived on the benevolence of their flocks, but here may some ask, whether the pastor were then bound to live upon voluntary contribution as upon almas. For who saith s? Paul 1 cor. 9. 7. Goeth the war at his own charges? Or who feedeth the flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? And again, 1 cor. 9. 13. 
Do you not know that they which minister about holy things, live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar, partake with the altar? That is to say, have part of that which is offered at the altar for their maintenance? And then he concludeth, Even so hath the Lord appointed, that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. From which place may be inferred indeed, that the pastors of the church ought to be maintained by their flocks. But not that the pastors were to determine, either the quantity, or the kind of their own allowance, and be, as it were, their own carvers. Their allowance must needs therefore be determined, either by the gratitude and liberality of every particular man of their flock, or by the whole congregation. By the whole congregation it could not be, because their acts were then no loss. Therefore the maintenance of pastors, before emperors and civil sovereigns had made laws to settle it, was nothing but benevolence. They that served at the altar lived on what was offered. In what court should they sue for it, who had no tribunals? Or if they had arbitrators amongst themselves, who should execute their judgments, when they had no power to arm their officers? It remaineth therefore, that there could be no certain maintenance assigned to any pastors of the church, but by the whole congregation. And then onely, when their decrees should have the force not onely of canons, but also of laws, which laws could not be made, but by emperors, kings, or other civil sovereigns. The right of tithes in Moses' law could not be applied to the then ministers of the gospel. Because Moses and the high priests were the civil sovereigns of the people under God, whose kingdom amongst the Jews was present, whereas the kingdom of God by Christ is yet to come. Hitherto hath been shown what the pastors of the church are. What are the points of their commission as that they were to preach, to teach, to baptize, to be presidents in their several congregations winky face what is ecclesiastical censure, viz. Excommunication, that is to say, in those places where Christianity was forbidden by the civil laws, a putting of themselves out of the company of the excommunicate. And where Christianity was by the civil law commanded, a putting the excommunicate out of the congregations of Christians who elected the pastors and ministers of the church, that it was the congregation, who consecrated and blessed them, that it was the pastor. What was their due revenue, that it was none but their own possessions, and their own labor, and the voluntary contributions of devout and grateful Christians? We are to consider now, what office those persons have, who being civil sovereigns, have embraced also the Christian faith. The civil sovereign being a Christian hath the right of appointing pastors. And first, we are to remember, that the right of judging what doctrines are fit for peace, and to be taught the subjects, is in all commonwealths inseparably annexed, as hath been already proved cha. 18. To the sovereign power civil, whether it be in one man, or in one assembly of men. For it is evident to the meanest capacity, that men's actions are derived from the opinions they have of the good, or evil, which from those actions redound unto themselves. And consequently, men that are once possessed of an opinion, that their obedience to the sovereign power, will be more hurtful to them, than their disobedience, will disobey the laws. And thereby overthrow the commonwealth, and introduce confusion, and civil war, for the avoiding whereof, all civil government was ordained. And therefore in all commonwealths of the heathen, the sovereigns have had the name of pastors of the people, because there was no subject that could lawfully teach the people but by their permission and authority. This right of the heathen kings cannot be thought taken from them by their conversion to the faith of Christ, who never ordained that kings for believing in him should be deposed, that is, subjected to any but himself, or, which is all one, be deprived of the power necessary for the conservation of peace amongst their subjects and for their defense against foreign enemies. And therefore Christian kings are still the supreme pastors of their people, and have power to ordain what pastors they please, to teach the church, that is, to teach the people committed to their charge. Again, let the right of choosing them be, as before the conversion of kings, in the church, for so it was in the time of the apostles themselves, as hath been shown already in this chapter. Even so also the right will be in the civil sovereign, Christian. For in that he is a Christian, he allows the teaching, and in that he is the sovereign, which is as much as to say, the church by representation, the teachers he elects, are elected by the church. And when an assembly of Christians choose their pastor in a Christian commonwealth, it is the sovereign that electeth him, because tis done by his authority. In the same manner, as when a town choose their mire, it is the act of him that hath the sovereign power. For every act done, 
is the act of him, without whose consent it is invalid. And therefore whatsoever examples may be drawn out of history concerning the election of pastors, by the people, or by the clergy, they are no arguments against the right of any civil sovereign. Because they that elected them did it by his authority. Seeing then in every Christian commonwealth, the civil sovereign is the supreme pastor, to whose charge the whole flock of his subjects is committed, and consequently that it is by his authority. That all other pastors are made, and have power to teach, and perform all other pastoral offices. It followeth also, that it is from the civil sovereign, that all other pastors derive their right of teaching, preaching, and other functions pertaining to that office. And that they are but his ministers. In the same manner as the magistrates of towns, judges and courts of justice, and commanders of armies, are all but ministers of him that is the magistrate of the whole commonwealth. Judge of all causes, and commander of the whole militia, which is always the civil sovereign. And the reason hereof, is not because they that teach, but because they that are to learn, are his subjects. For let it be supposed, that a Christian king commit the authority of ordaining pastors in his dominions to another king, as diverse Christian kings allow that power to the Pope. He doth not thereby constitute a pastor over himself, nor a sovereign pastor over his people, for that were to deprive himself of the civil power. Which depending on the opinion men have of their duty to him, and the fear they have of punishment in another world, would depend also on the skill and loyalty of doctors, who are no less subject. Not only to ambition, but also to ignorance, than any other sort of men. So that where a stranger hath authority to appoint teachers, it is given him by the sovereign in whose dominions he teacheth. Christian doctors are our schoolmasters to Christianity. But kings are fathers of families, and may receive schoolmasters for their subjects from the recommendation of a stranger, but not from the command. Especially when the ill-teaching them shall redound to the great and manifest profit of him that recommends them, nor can they be obliged to retain them, longer than it is for the public good. The care of which they stand so long charged with all, as they retain any other essential right of the sovereignty. The pastoral authority of sovereigns only is de jure divino, that of other pastors is jure civili. If a man therefore should ask a pastor, in the execution of his office, as the chief priests and elders of the people, Matt. 21.23, asked our Savior, by what authority dost thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? He can make no other just answer but that he doth it by the authority of the commonwealth, given him by the king, or assembly that representeth it. All pastors, except the supreme, execute their charges in the right, that is by the authority of the civil sovereign, that is, jur civili. But the king, and every other sovereign executeth his office of supreme pastor, by immediate authority from God, that is to say, in God's right, or jur divino. And therefore none but kings can put into their titles, a mark of their submission to God onely, de gratia rex, etc. Bishops ought to say in the beginning of their mandates, by the favor of the king's majesty, bishop of such a diocese. Or as civil ministers, in his majesty's name. For in saying, divina providentia, which is the same with de gratia, though disguised. They deny to have received their authority from the civil state, and slyly slip off the collar of their civil subjection, contrary to the unity and defense of the commonwealth. Christian kings have power to execute all manner of pastoral function. But if every Christian sovereign be the supreme pastor of his own subjects, it seemeth that he hath also the authority, not only to preach, which perhaps no man will deny, but also to baptize, and to administer the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and to consecrate both temples and pastors to God's service, which most men deny, partly because they use not to do it and partly because the administration of sacraments and consecration of persons and places to holy uses requireth the imposition of such men's hands. As by the like imposition successively from the time of the apostles have been ordained to the like ministry. For proof therefore that Christian kings have power to baptize and to consecrate, I am to render a reason, both why they use not to do it, and how. Without the ordinary ceremony of imposition of hands, they are made capable of doing it when they will. There is no doubt but any king, in case he were skillful in the sciences, might by the same right of his office, read lectures of them himself, by which he authorizeth others to read them in the universities. Nevertheless, because the care of the summy of the business of the commonwealth taketh up his whole time, 
it were not convenient for him to apply himself in person to that particular. A king may also, if he please, sit in judgment, to hear and determine all manner of causes, as well as give others authority to do it in his name. But that the charge that lieth upon him of command and government constrain him to be continually at the helm, and to commit the ministerial offices to others under him. In the like manner our Savior, who surely had power to baptize, baptized none himself, but sent his apostles and disciples to baptize. John 4.2 So also s. Paul, by the necessity of preaching in divers and far distant places, baptized few. Amongst all the Corinthians he baptized only Crispus, Cages, and Stephanus. 1 Cor 1.14, 16. And the reason was, because his principal charge was to preach. 1 Cor 1.17. Whereby it is manifest that the greater charge, such as is the government of the church, is a dispensation for the less. The reason therefore why Christian kings use not to baptize is evident, and the same, for which at this day there are few baptized by bishops, and by the Pope fewer. And as concerning imposition of hands, whether it be needful, for the authorizing of a king to baptize and consecrate, we may consider thus. Imposition of hands was a most ancient public ceremony amongst the Jews, by which was designed, and made certain, the person, or other thing intended in a man's prayer, blessing, sacrifice, consecration, condemnation, or other speech. So Jacob in blessing the children of Joseph, Jen. 48.14 laid his right hand on Ephraim the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh the firstborn. And this he did wittingly, though they were so presented to him by Joseph, as he was forced in doing it to stretch out his arms across, to design to whom he intended the greater blessing. So also in the sacrificing of the burnt offering, Aaron is commanded, Exodus 29.10, to lay his hands on the head of the bullock, and ver. 15, to lay his hand on the head of the ram. The same is also said again, Levit. 1.4 and 8.14. Likewise Moses, when he ordained Joshua to be captain of the Israelites, that is, consecrated him to God's service, Num. 27.23, laid his hands upon him, and gave him his charge, designing and rendering certain, who it was they were to obey in war. And in the consecration of the Levites, Num. 8.10. God commanded that the children of Israel should put their hands upon the Levites, and in the condemnation of him that had blasphemed the Lord, Levit. 24.14 God commanded that all that heard him should lay their hands on his head, and that all the congregation should stone him. And why should they only that heard him lay their hands upon him? And not rather a priest, Levite, or other minister of justice, but that none else were able to design and demonstrate to the eyes of the congregation who it was that had blasphemed and ought to die, and to design a man, or any other thing, by the hand to the eye is less subject to mistake, than when it is done to the ear by a name. And so much was this ceremony observed, that in blessing the whole congregation at once, which cannot be done by laying on of hands, yet, Aaron, Levit. 9.22, did lift up his hand towards the people when he blessed them? And we read also of the like ceremony of consecration of temples amongst the heathen as that the priest laid his hands on some post of the temple, all the while he was uttering the words of consecration. So natural it is to design any individual thing, rather by the hand, to assure the eyes, than by words to inform the ear in matters of God's public service. This ceremony was not therefore new in our Savior's time. For Jarius, Mark 5.23, whose daughter was sick, besought our Savior not to heal her, but to lay his hands upon her, that she might be healed. And math. 19.13. They brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them, and pray. According to this ancient rite, the apostles, and presbyters, and the presbytery itself, laid hands on them whom they ordained pastors. And withal prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And that not only once, but sometimes oftener, when a new occasion was presented. But the end was still the same, namely a punctual, and religious designation of the person, ordained either to the pastoral charge in general, or to a particular mission, so act. 6.6. .6, the apostles prayed, and laid their hands on the seven deacons. Which was done, not to give them the Holy Ghost, for they were full of the Holy Ghost before thy were chosen, as appeareth immediately before, verse 3, but to design them to that office. 
And after Philip the deacon had converted certain persons in Samaria, Peter and John went down Act. 8.17 And laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And not only an apostle, but a presbyter had this power. For S. Paul Adveseth Timothy, 1 Tim. 5.22 Lay hands suddenly on no man, that is, design no man rashly to the office of a pastor. The whole presbytery laid their hands on Timothy, as we read 1 Tim. For point one four, but this is to be understood, as that some did it by the appointment of the presbytery, and most likely their proestos, or prolocutor, which it may be with St. Paul himself. For in his two epis to Tim, version 6, he saith to him, Stir up the gift of God which is in thee, by the laying on of my hands. Where know, by the way, that by the Holy Ghost, is not meant the third person in the Trinity, but the gifts necessary to the pastoral office. We read also that St. Paul had imposition of hands twice, once from Ananias at Damascus, Acts 9.17.18, at the time of his baptism. And again, Acts 13.3, at Antioch, when he was first sent out to preach. The use then of this ceremony considered in the ordination of pastors was to design the person to whom they gave such power. But if there had been then any Christian that had had the power of teaching before, the baptizing of him, that is the making of him a Christian, had given him no new power, but had only caused him to preach true doctrine, that is, to use his power aright. And therefore the imposition of hands had been unnecessary, baptism itself had been sufficient. But every sovereign, before Christianity, had the power of teaching and ordaining teachers, and therefore Christianity gave them no new right, but only directed them in the way of teaching truth. And consequently they needed no imposition of hands, besides that which is done in baptism, to authorize them to exercise any part of the pastoral function, as namely, to baptize and consecrate. And in the Old Testament, though the priest only had right to consecrate, during the time that the sovereignty was in the high priest. Yet it was not so when the sovereignty was in the king. For we read, 1 Kings 8, that Solomon blessed the people, consecrated the temple, and pronounce that public prayer, which is the pattern now for consecration of all Christian churches and chapels, whereby it appears he had not only the right of ecclesiastical government, but also of exercising ecclesiastical functions. The civil sovereign, if a Christian, is head of the church in his own dominions. From this consolidation of the right politique and ecclesiastique and Christian sovereigns, it is evident they have all manner of power over their subjects that can be given to man. For the government of men's external actions, both in policy and religion, and may make such laws as themselves shall judge fittest for the government of their own subjects, both as they are the commonwealth and as they are the church. For both state and church are the same men. If they please, therefore, they may, as many Christian kings now do, commit the government of their subjects in matters of religion to the Pope. But then the Pope is in that point subordinate to them. An exorcist that charge in another's dominion jur civili, in the right of the civil sovereign, not jur divino, in God's right. And may therefore be discharged of that office, when the sovereign for the good of his subjects shall think it necessary. They may also, if they please, commit the care of religion to one supreme pastor, or to an assembly of pastors. And give them what power over the church, or one over another, they think most convenient, and what titles of honor, as of bishops, archbishops, priests, or presbyters, they will, and make such laws for their maintenance, either by tithes or otherwise, as they please, so they do it out of a sincere conscience, of which God only is the judge. It is the civil sovereign that is to appoint judges and interpreters of the canonical scriptures, for it is he that mocketh them loss. It is he also that giveth strength to excommunications which but for such laws and punishments as may humble obstinate libertines and reduce them to union with the rest of the church would be contemned. In summing, he hath the supreme power in all causes, as well ecclesiastical, as civil, as far as concerneth actions and words, for these only are known and may be accused. And of that which cannot be accused, there is no judge at all, but God, that knoweth the heart. And these rights are incident to all sovereigns, whether monarchs or assemblies, for they that are the representatives of a Christian people are representatives of the church. For a church and a commonwealth of Christian people are the same thing.
Cardinal Bellarmine's books de summo pontificus considered. Though this that I have here said, and in other places of this book, seem clear enough for the asserting of the supreme ecclesiastical power to Christian sovereigns. Yet because the Pope of Rome's challenge to that power universally have been maintained chiefly, and I think as strongly as is possible, by Cardinal Bellarmine. In his controversy de summo pontifice, I have thought it necessary, as briefly as I can, to examine the grounds and strength of his discourse. The first book. Of five books he hath written of this subject, the first conineth three questions. One, which is simply the best government, monarchy, aristocracy, or democracy. And concludeth for neither, but for a government mixed of all there. Another, which of these is the best government of the church? And concludeth for the mixed, but which should most participate of monarchy? The third, whether in this mixed monarchy, St. Peter had the place of monarch. Concerning his first conclusion, I have already sufficiently proved, chapped. 18. That all governments which men are bound to obey are simple and absolute. In monarchy there is but one man supreme, and all other men that have any kind of power in the state have it by his commission, during his pleasure, and executed in his name, and in aristocracy and democracy, but one supreme assembly, with the same power that in monarchy belongeth to the monarch, which is not a mixed, but an absolute sovereignty. And of the three sorts, which is the best, is not to be disputed, where any one of them is already established, but the present ought always to be preferred, maintained, and accounted best. Because it is against both the law of nature and the divine positive law to do anything tending to the subversion thereof. Besides, it mocketh nothing to the power of any pastor, unless he have the civil sovereignty, what kind of government is the best. Because their calling is not to govern men by commandment, but to teach them, and persuade them by arguments, and leave it to them to consider whether they shall embrace or reject the doctrine taught. For monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy do mark out unto us three sorts of sovereigns, not of pastors. Or, as we may say, three sorts of masters of families, not three sorts of schoolmasters for their children. And therefore the second conclusion, concerning the best form of government of the church, is nothing to the question of the Pope's power without his own dominions. For in all other commonwealths his power, if he have any at all, is that of the schoolmaster only, and not of the master of the family. For the third conclusion, which is, that St. Peter was monarch of the church, he bringeth for his chief argument the place of S. Math. Chap 16.18, 19. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, etc. And I will give thee the keys of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. Which place well considered, proveth no more. But that the church of Christ hath for foundation one only article, namely, that which Peter in the name of all the apostles professing, gave occasion to our Savior to speak the words here cited. Which that we may clearly understand, we are to consider, that our Savior preached by himself, by John Baptist, and by his apostles, nothing but this article of faith, that he was the Christ. All other articles requiring faith no otherwise, than is founded on that. John began first, Matt. 3.2. Preaching only this, the kingdom of God is at hand. Then our Savior himself, Matt. For point one seven, preached the same, and to his twelve apostles, when he gave them their commission, Matt. 10.7. There is no mention of preaching any other article but that. This was the fundamental article, that is the foundation of the church's faith. Afterwards the apostles being returned to him, he asketh them all, Matt. 16.13. Not Peter only, who men said he was, and they answered, that some said he was John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, then Ver. 15. He asked them all again, Not Peter only, whom say ye that I am? Therefore Peter answered, For them all, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Which I said is the foundation of the faith of the whole church, from which our Savior takes the occasion of saying, Upon this stone I will build my church by which it is manifest that by the foundation stone of the church was meant the fundamental article of the church's faith. But why then, will some object, doth our Savior interpose these words, Thou art Peter. If the origin all of this text had been rigidly translated, the reason would easily have appeared. 
We are therefore to consider that the Apostle Simon was surnamed Stone, which is the signification of the Syriac word Cephas and of the Greek word Petrus. Our Savior therefore, after the confession of that fundamental article, alluding to his name, said, as if it were in English, Thus, thou art stone, and upon this stone I will build my church. Which is as much as to say, this article, that, I am the Christ, is the foundation of all the faith I require in those that are to be members of my church. Neither is this allusion to a name, an unusual thing in common speech. But it had been a strange and obscure speech if our Savior intending to build his church on the person of St. Peter had said, Thou art a stone, and upon this stone I will build my church. When it was so obvious without ambiguity to have said, I will build my church on thee, and yet there had been still the same allusion to his name. And for the following words, I will give thee the keys of heaven, etc., it is no more than what our Savior gave also to all the rest of his disciples, Math. 18.18 Whatsoever you shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. But howsoever this be interpreted, there is no doubt but the power here granted belongs to all supreme pastors, such as are all Christian civil sovereigns in their own dominions. In so much, as if St. Peter, or our Savior himself, had converted any of them to believe him, and to acknowledge his kingdom. Yet because his kingdom is not of this world, he had left the supreme care of converting his subjects to none but him. Or else he must have deprived him of the sovereignty, to which the right of teaching is inseparably annexed. And thus much in refutation of his first book, wherein he would prove St. Peter to have been the monarch universal of the church, that is to say, of all the Christians in the world. The second book. The second book hath two conclusions. One, that S. Peter was bishop of Rome, and there died. The other, that the popes of Rome are his successors. Both which have been disputed by others. But supposing them to be true, yet if by bishop of Rome be understood either the monarch of the church, or the supreme pastor of it. Not Sylvester, but Constantine, who was the first Christian emperor, was that bishop, and as Constantine, so all other Christian emperors were of right supreme bishops of the Roman Empire. I say of the Roman Empire, not of all Christendom, for other Christian sovereigns had the same right in their several territories as to an office essentially adherent to their sovereignty, which shall serve for answer to his second book. The third book. In the third book, he handleth the question whether the Pope be Antichrist. For my part, I see no argument that proves he is so, in that sense that Scripture useth the name. Nor will I take any argument from the quality of Antichrist, to contradict the authority he exerciseth, or hath heretofore exercised in the dominions of any other prince or state. It is evident that the prophets of the Old Testament foretold, and the Jews expected a Messiah, that is, a Christ, that should re-establish amongst them the kingdom of God, which had been rejected by them in the time of Samuel, when they required a king after the manner of other nations. This expectation of theirs made them obnoxious to the imposture of all such, as had both the ambition to attempt the attaining of the kingdom, and the art to deceive the people by counterfeit miracles, by hypocritical life, or by orations and doctrine plausible. Our Savior, therefore, and his apostles forewarned men of false prophets and of false Christs. False Christs are such as pretend to be the Christ, but are not, and are called properly Antichrists in such sense as when there happen at the schism in the church by the election of two popes. The one calleth the other anti-papa, or the false pope. And therefore Antichrist in the proper signification hath two essential marks, one, that he denieth Jesus to be Christ, and another that he professeth himself to be Christ. The first mark is set down by S. John in his one epist. 4. CH3. Ver. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist. The other mark is expressed in the words of our Savior, Matt. 24.5 Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And again, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, there is Christ, believe it not. And therefore Antichrist must be a false Christ, that is, some one of them that shall pretend themselves to be Christ. And out of these two marks, to deny Jesus to be the Christ, and to affirm himself to be the Christ, it followeth, that he must also be an adversary of the true Christ. Which is another usual signification of the word Antichrist. 
But of these many Antichrists, there is one special one, O Antichristos, the Antichrist, or Antichrist definitely, is one certain person, not indefinitely an Antichrist. Now seeing the Pope of Rome, neither pretendeth himself, nor denieth Jesus to be the Christ, I perceive not how he can be called Antichrist. By which word is not meant, one that falsely pretendeth to be his lieutenant, or vicar general, but to be he. There is also some mark of the time of this special Antichrist, as Matt. 24.15 When that abominable destroyer, spoken of by Daniel, Dan. 9.27 Shall stand in the holy place, in such tribulation as was not since the beginning of the world, nor ever shall be again, insomuch as if it were to last long, ver. 22. No flesh could be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened made fewer. But that tribulation is not yet come, for it is to be followed immediately, ver. 29. By a darkening of the sun and moon, a falling of the stars, a concussion of the heavens, and the glorious coming again of our Savior, in the Clutes. And therefore the Antichrist is not yet come, whereas, many popes are both come and gone. It is true, the Pope in taking upon him to give laws to all Christian kings and nations, usurpeth a kingdom in this world, which Christ took not on him. But he doth it not as Christ, but as for Christ, wherein there is nothing of the Antichrist. The Fourth Book In the Fourth Book, to prove the Pope to be the supreme judge in all questions of faith and manners, which is as much as to be the absolute monarch of all Christians in the world. Be bringeth three propositions, the first, that his judgments are infallible, the second, that he can make very laws, and punish those that observe them not. The third, that our Savior conferred all jurisdiction ecclesiastical on the Pope of Rome. Text for the infallibility of the Pope's judgment and points of faith. For the infallibility of his judgments, he allegeth the scriptures, and first, that of Luke 22.31. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. This, according to Bellarmine's exposition, is that Christ gave here to Simon Peter two privileges. One, that neither his faith should fail, neither he nor any of his successors should ever define any point concerning faith or manners erroneously or contrary to the definition of a former pope. Which is a strange and very much strained interpretation. But he that with attention readeth that chapter, shall find there is no place in the whole scripture, that mocketh more against the Pope's authority, than this very place. The priests and scribes seeking to kill our Savior at the Passover, and Judas possessed with a resolution to betray him, in the day of killing the Passover being come. Our Savior celebrated the same with his apostles, which he said, till the kingdom of God was come he would do no more. And withal told them, that one of them was to betray him. Hereupon they questioned, which of them it should be. And withal, seeing the next Passover their master would celebrate should be when he was king, entrade into a contention, who should then be the greater man. Our Savior therefore told them, that the kings of the nations had dominion over their subjects, and are called by a name, in Hebrew, that signifies bountiful. But I cannot be so to you, you must endeavor to serve one another, I ordain you a kingdom, but it is such as my father hath ordained me. A kingdom that I am now to purchase with my blood, and not to possess till my second coming. Then you shall eat and drink at my table, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then addressing himself to Saint Peter, he saith, Simon, Simon, Satan seeks by suggesting a present domination, to weaken your faith of the future. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith shall not fail. Thou therefore, note this, being converted, and understanding my kingdom as of another world, confirm the same faith in thy brethren. To which s. Peter answered, as one that no more expected any authority in this world, Lord I am ready to go with thee, not only to prison, but to death, whereby it is manifest. s. Peter had not only no jurisdiction given him in this world, but a charge to teach all the other apostles, that they also should have none. And for the infallibility of St. Peter's sentence definitive in matter of faith, there is no more to be attributed to it out of this text than that Peter should continue in the belief of this point. Namely, that Christ should come again and possess the kingdom at the day of judgment, which was not given by the text to all his successors, for we see they claim it in the world that now is. The second place is that of math. 
16. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. By which, as I have already shown in this chapter, is proved no more. Then that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the confession of Peter, which gave occasion to that speech, namely this, that Jesus is Christ the Son of God. The third text is John 21, verse 16, 17. Feed my sheep, which contains no more but a commission of teaching, and if we grant the rest of the apostles to be contained in that name of sheep. Then it is the supreme power of teaching, but it was only for the time that there were no Christian sovereigns already possessed of that supremacy. But I have already proved that Christian sovereigns are in their own dominions the supreme pastors, and instituted there too, by virtue of their being baptized. Though without other imposition of hands, for such imposition being a ceremony of designing the person is needless when he is already designed to the power of teaching what doctrine he will. By his institution to an absolute power over his subjects. For as I have proved before, sovereigns are supreme teachers in general, by their office and therefore oblige themselves, by their baptism, to teach the doctrine of Christ. And when they suffer others to teach their people, they do it at the peril of their own souls. For it is at the hands of the heads of families that God will require the account of the instruction of his children and servants. It is of Abraham himself, not of a hireling, that God saith Jin. 18.19 I know him that he will command his children, and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord, and do justice and judgment. The fourth place is that of Exodus. 28.30 Thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, which he saith is interpreted by the Septuagint, Delis and Chi Alethean, that is, evidence and truth. And thence concludeth, God had given evidence and truth, which is almost infallibility, to the high priest. But be it evidence and truth itself that was given, or be it but admonition to the priest to endeavor to inform himself clearly, and give judgment uprightly. Yet in that it was given to the high priest, it was given to the civil sovereign for next under God was the high priest in the commonwealth of Israel. And is an argument for evidence and truth, that is, for the ecclesiastical supremacy of civil sovereigns over their own subjects, against the pretended power of the Pope. These are all the texts he bringeth for the infallibility of the judgment of the Pope, in point of faith. Text for the same in point of manners. For the infallibility of his judgment concerning manners, he bringeth one text, which is that of John 16.13. When the Spirit of truth is come, he will lead you into all truth, where, saith he, by all truth, is meant, at least, all truth necessary to salvation. But with this mitigation, he attributeth no more infallibility to the Pope, than to any man that professeth Christianity, and is not to be damned. For if any man err in any point, wherein not to err is necessary to salvation, it is impossible he should be saved. For that only is necessary to salvation without which to be saved is impossible. What points these are, I shall declare out of the scripture in the chapter following. In this place I say no more, but that though it were granted, the Pope could not possibly teach any error at all, yet doth not this entitle him to any jurisdiction in the dominions of another prince. Unless we shall also say, a man is obliged in conscience to set on work upon all occasions the best workman, even then also when he hath formerly promised his work to another. Besides the text, he argueth from reason, thus, if the Pope could err in necessaries, then Christ hath not sufficiently provided for the Church's salvation, because he hath commanded her to follow the Pope's directions. But this reason is invalid, unless he shew when, and where Christ commanded that, or took at all any notice of a Pope, nay granting whatsoever was given to S. Peter was given to the Pope. Yet seeing there is in the Scripture no command to any man to obey St. Peter, no man can be just that obeyeth him, when his commands are contrary to those of his lawful sovereign. Lastly, it hath not been declared by the church, nor by the Pope himself, that he is the civil sovereign of all the Christians in the world. And therefore all Christians are not bound to acknowledge his jurisdiction in point of manners. For the civil sovereignty and supreme judicature in controversies of manners are the same thing. And the makers of civil laws are not only declarers but also makers of the justice and injustice of actions. There being nothing in men's manners that makes them righteous or unrighteous, but their conformity with the law of the sovereign.
And therefore when the Pope challengeth supremacy in controversies of manners, he teacheth men to disobey the civil sovereign. Which is an erroneous doctrine, contrary to the many precepts of our Savior and his apostles, delivered to us in the Scripture. To prove the Pope has power to make laws, he allegeth many places, as first, D.U.T. 17.12 The man that will do presumptuously, and will not hearken unto the priest, that standeth to minister there before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall die. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. For answer whereunto, we are to remember that the high priest, next and immediately under God, was the civil sovereign. And all judges were to be constituted by him. The words all edged sound therefore thus. The man that will presume to disobey the civil sovereign for the time being, or any of his officers in the execution of their places, that man shall die. Etc., which is clearly for the civil sovereignty, against the universal power of the Pope. Secondly, he allegeth that of math. 16. Whatsoever ye shall bind, etc., and interpreteth it for such binding as is attributed math. 23.4. To the scribes and Pharisees, they bind heavy burthens, and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, by which is meant, he says, making of laws. And concludes thence, the Pope can make laws. But this also mocketh only for the legislative power of civil sovereigns, for the scribes, and Pharisees sat in Moses' chire, but Moses next under God was sovereign of the people of Israel. And therefore our Savior commanded them to do all that they should say, but not all that they should do. That is, to obey their laws, but not follow their example. The third place is John 21.16. Feed my sheep, which is not a power to make laws, but a command to teach. Making laws belongs to the Lord of the family who by his own discretion chooseth his chaplain, as also a schoolmaster to teach his children. The fourth place John 20.21 is against him. The words are, As my Father sent me, so send I you. But our Savior was sent to redeem, by his death, such as should believe. And by his own, and his apostles preaching to prepare them for their entrance into his kingdom. Which he himself saith, is not of this world, and hath taught us to pray for the coming of it hereafter, though he refused, Acts 1.6-7, to tell his apostles when it should come. And in which, when it comes, the twelve apostles shall sit on twelve thrones, every one perhaps as high as that of St. Peter, to judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Seeing then God the Father sent not our Savior to make laws in this present world, we may conclude from the text that neither did our Savior send S. Peter to make laws here. But to persuade men to expect his second coming with a steadfast faith, and in the meantime, if subjects, to obey their princes. And if princes, both to believe it themselves, and to do their best to make their subjects do the same, which is the office of a bishop. Therefore this place mocketh most strongly for the joining of the ecclesiastical supremacy to the civil sovereignty, contrary to that which Cardinal Bellarmine allegeth it for. The fifth place is Acts 15.28. It hath seemed good to the Holy Spirit, and to us, to lay upon you no greater burden, than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blowed, and from things strangled, and from fornication. Here he notes the word laying of burdens for the legislative power. But who is there, that reading this text, can say, this style of the apostles may not as properly be used in giving counsel, as in making laws? The style of a law is, we command, but, we think good, is the ordinary style of them, that but give advice. And they lay a burthen that give advice, though it be conditional, that is, if they to whom they give it, will attain their ends. And such is the burthen, of abstaining from things strangled, and from blowed, not absolute, but in case they will not err. I have shown before chapter 25, that law, is distinguished from counsel, in this, that the reason of a law, is taken from the design, and benefit of him that prescribeth it. But the reason of a counsel, from the design, and benefit of him, to whom the counsel is given. But here, the apostles aim only at the benefit of the converted Gentiles, namely their salvation, not at their own benefit. For having done their endeavor, they shall have their reward, whether they be obeyed or not. And therefore the acts of this counsel were not laws, but counsels. The sixth place is that of Rom. 13. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, which is meant, 
he saith not only of secular, but also of ecclesiastical princes. To which I answer, first, that there are no ecclesiastical princes but those that are also civil sovereigns, and their principalities exceed not the compasse of their civil sovereignty. Uh. Without those bounds though they may be received for doctors, they cannot be acknowledged for princes. For if the apostle had meant, we should be subject both to our own princes, and also to the Pope, he had taught us a doctrine, which Christ himself hath told us is impossible, namely, to serve two masters. And though the apostle say in another place, I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness. According to the power which the Lord hath given me, it is not, that he challenged a power either to put to death, imprison, banish, whip, or fine any of them, which are punishments, but only to excommunicate, which, without the civil power, is no more but a leaving of their company, and having no more to do with them, than with a heathen man, or a publican. Which in many occasions might be a greater pain to the excommunicant, than to the excommunicate. The seventh place is 1 Cor 4.21. Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, in the spirit of lenity? But here again, it is not the power of a magistrate to punish offenders, that is meant by a rod. But only the power of excommunication, which is not in its own nature a punishment, but only a denouncing of punishment that Christ shall inflict when he shall be in possession of his kingdom at the day of judgment. Nor then also shall it be properly a punishment as upon a subject that hath broken the law, but a revenge as upon an enemy or revolter that denieth the right of our Savior to the kingdom. And therefore this proveth not the legislative power of any bishop that is not also the civil power. The eighth place is Timothy 3.2. A bishop must be the husband but of one wife, vigilant, sober, etc., which he saith was a law. I thought that none could make a law in the church, but the monarch of the church, St. Peter. But suppose this precept made by the authority of St. Peter, yet I see no reason why to call it a law, rather than an advice, seeing Timothy was not a subject, but a disciple of St. Paul. Nor the flock under the charge of Timothy is subjects in the kingdom, but is scholars in the school of Christ. If all the precepts he giveth Timothy be laws, why is not this also a law? Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy health's sake? And why are not also the precepts of good physicians so many laws? But that it is not the imperative manner of speaking, but an absolute subjection to a person that mocketh his precept laws. In like manner, the ninth place, 1 Tim. 5, 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses is a wise precept, but not a law. The tenth place is Luke 10.16. He that heareth you, heareth me. And he that despiseth you, despiseth me. And there is no doubt, but he that despiseth the counsel of those that are sent by Christ, despiseth the counsel of Christ himself. But who are those now that are sent by Christ, but such as are ordained pastors by lawful authority? And who are lawfully ordained, that are not ordained by the sovereign pastor? And who is ordained by the sovereign pastor in a Christian commonwealth, that is not ordained by the authority of the sovereign thereof? Out of this place therefore it followeth, that he which heareth is sovereign being a Christian, heareth Christ. And he that despiseth the doctrine which his king being a Christian, authorizeth, despiseth the doctrine of Christ, which is not that which Bellarmine intendeth here to prove, but the contrary. But all this is nothing to a law. Nay more, a Christian king, as a pastor and teacher of his subjects, makes not thereby his doctrines laws. He cannot oblige men to believe. Though as a civil sovereign he may make laws suitable to his doctrine, which may oblige men to certain actions, and sometimes to such as they would not otherwise do, and which he ought not to command, and yet when they are commanded, they are laws. And the external actions done in obedience to them, without the inward approbation, are the actions of the sovereign, and not of the subject, which is in that case but as an instrument, without any motion of his own at all, because God hath commanded to obey them. The eleventh is every place, where the apostle for counsel putteth some word, by which men used to signify command, or calleth the following of his counsel, by the name of obedience. And therefore they are all edged out of one cor. 11.2 I commend you for keeping my precepts as I delivered them to you. The Greek is, I commend you for keeping those things I delivered to you. As I delivered them. 
which is far from signifying that they were laws, or anything else, but good counsel. And that of one Thess, 4.2. You know what commandments we gave you. Where the Greek word is paragilias edokamen, equivalent to paradokamen, what we delivered to you, as in the place next before all edged, which does not prove the traditions of the apostles. To be any more than counsels, though as is said in the 8th verse, he that despiseth them, despiseth not man, but God for our Savior himself came not to judge, that is, to be king in this world, but to sacrifice himself for sinners, and leave doctors in his church, to lead, not to drive men to Christ, who never accepteth forced actions, which is all the law protesteth. But the inward conversion of the heart, which is not the work of laws, but of counsel and doctrine, and that of two Thess, 3.14. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Where from the word obey, he would infer, that this epistle was a law to the Thessalonians. The epistles of the emperors were indeed laws. If therefore the epistle of S. Paul were also a law, they were to obey two masters. But the word obey, as it is in the Greek apikouiai, signifieth hearkening to, or putting in practice, not only that which is commanded by him that has right to punish, but also that which is delivered in a way of counsel for our good, and therefore St. Paul does not bid kill him that disobeys, nor beat, nor imprison, nor immerse him, which legislators may all do. But avoid his company, that he may be ashamed, whereby it is evident, it was not the empire of an apostle, but his reputation amongst the faithful, which the Christians stood in awe of. The last place is that of Hep. 13.17. Obey your leaders, and submit yourselves to them, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account. And here also is intended by obedience, a following of their counsel. For the reason of our obedience is not drawn from the will and command of our pastors, but from our own benefit, as being the salvation of our souls they watch for. And not for the exaltation of their own power and authority. If it were meant here, that all they teach were laws, then not only the Pope, but every pastor in his parish should have legislative power. Again, they that are bound to obey, their pastors, have no power to examine their commands. What then shall we say to St. John who bids us, 1 Epist? Chapter 4. Version 1. Not to believe every spirit, but to try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. It is therefore manifest, that we may dispute the doctrine of our pastors, but no man can dispute a law. The commands of civil sovereigns are on all sides granted to be laws. If any else can make a law besides himself, all commonwealth, and consequently all peace, and justice must cease, which is contrary to all laws, both divine and humane. Nothing therefore can be drawn from these, or any other places of Scripture, to prove the decrees of the Pope, where he has not also the civil sovereignty, to be laws. The question of superiority between the Pope and other bishops the last point he would prove, is this. That our Savior Christ has committed ecclesiastical jurisdiction immediately to none but the Pope, wherein he handleth not the question of supremacy between the Pope and Christian kings, but between the Pope and other bishops. And first, he says it is agreed, that the jurisdiction of bishops is at least in the general de jure divino, that is, in the right of God, for which he all edges s. Paul, f's. For point one one, where he says, that Christ after his ascension into heaven, gave gifts to men, some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and some teachers. And thence in fur res, they have indeed their jurisdiction in God's right, but will not grant they have it immediately from God, but derived through the Pope. But if a man may be said to have his jurisdiction de jure divino, and yet not immediately, what lawful jurisdiction, though but civil, is there in a Christian commonwealth that is not also de jure divino? For Christian kings have their civil power from God immediately, and the magistrates under him exercise their several charges in virtue of his commission. Wherein that which they do is no less de jure divino mediato than that which the bishops do in virtue of the Pope's ordination. All lawful power is of God, immediately in the supreme governor, immediately in those that have authority under him. So that either he must grant every constable in the state to hold his office in the right of God, or he must not hold that any bishop holds his so, besides the Pope himself. But this whole dispute, 
whether Christ left the jurisdiction to the Pope only, or to other bishops also, if considered out of these places where the Pope has the civil sovereignty, is a contention de Lana Caprina, for none of them, where they are not sovereigns, has any jurisdiction at all. For jurisdiction is the power of hearing and determining causes between man and man, and can belong to none, but him that hath the power to prescribe the rules of right and wrong. That is, to make laws, and with the sword of justice to compel men to obey his decisions, pronounced either by himself, or by the judges he ordaineth thereunto. Which none can lawfully do, but the civil sovereign. Therefore when he allegeth out of the six of Luke, that our Savior called his disciples together, and chose twelve of them which he named apostles, he proveth that he elected them, all. Except Matthias, Paul and Barnabas, and gave them power and command to preach, but not to judge of causes between man and man. For that is a power which he refused to take upon himself, saying, Who made me a judge, or a divider, amongst you, and in another place? My kingdom is not of this world, but he that hath not the power to hear, and determine causes between man and man, cannot be said to have any jurisdiction at all. And yet this hinders not, but that our Savior gave them power to preach and baptize in all parts of the world, supposing they were not by their own lawful sovereign forbidden. For to our own sovereigns Christ himself, and his apostles have in sundry places expressly commanded us in all things to be obedient. The arguments by which he would prove that bishops receive their jurisdiction from the Pope, seeing the Pope in the dominions of other princes hath no jurisdiction himself, are all in vain. Yet because they prove, on the contrary, that all bishops receive jurisdiction when they have it from their civil sovereigns, I will not omit the recital of them. The first is from Numbers 11 where Moses not being able alone to undergo the whole burthen of administering the affairs of the people of Israel, God commanded him to choose seventy elders, and took part of the spirit of Moses. To put it upon those seventy elders, by which it is understood, not that God weakened the spirit of Moses, for that had not eased him at all, but that they had all of them their authority from him. Wherein he doth truly and ingenuously interpret that place. But seeing Moses had the entire sovereignty in the commonwealth of the Jews, it is manifest that it is thereby signified that they had their authority from the civil sovereign. And therefore that place proveth that bishops in every Christian commonwealth have their authority from the civil sovereign. And from the Pope in his own territories only, and not in the territories of any other state. The second argument is from the nature of monarchy, wherein all authority is in one man, and in others by derivation from him. But the government of the church, he says, is monarchical. This also makes for Christian monarchs. For they are really monarchs of their own people, that is, of their own church, for the church is the same thing with a Christian people. Whereas the power of the Pope, though he were s. Peter, is neither monarchy, nor hath anything of archical, nor cratical, but only of didactical. For God accepteth not a forced, but a willing obedience. The third, is, from that the sea of S. Peter is called by S. Cyprian, the head, the source, the root, the son, from whence the authority of bishops is derived. But by the law of nature, which is a better principle of right and wrong, than the word of any doctor that is but a man, the civil sovereign in every commonwealth, is the head, the source, the root, and the son, from which all jurisdiction is derived. And therefore, the jurisdiction of bishops is derived from the civil sovereign. The fourth is taken from the inequality of their jurisdictions, for if God saith he had given it them immediately, he had given us well equality of jurisdiction as of order. But we see, some are bishops but of own town, some of a hundred towns, and some of many whole provinces, which differences were not determined by the command of God. Their jurisdiction therefore is not of God, but of man, and one has a greater another a less, as it pleaseth the prince of the church. Which argument, if he had proved before, that the Pope had had an universal jurisdiction over all Christians, had been for his purpose. But seeing that hath not been proved, and that it is notoriously known, the large jurisdiction of the Pope was given him by those that had it, that is, by the emperors of Rome. For the patriarch of Constantinople, upon the same title, namely, of being bishop of the capital city of the empire, and seat of the emperor, claim to be equal to him, it followeth. That all other bishops have their jurisdiction from the sovereigns of the place wherein they exercise the same, 
and as for that cause they have not their authority de jure divino. So neither hath the Pope his de jure divino, except only where he is also the civil sovereign. His fifth argument is this, if bishops have their jurisdiction immediately from God, the Pope could not take it from them, for he condone nothing contrary to God's ordination. And this consequence is good and well proved. But, saith he, the Pope can do this, and has done it. This also is granted, so he do it in his own dominions, or in the dominions of any other prince that hath given him that power. But not universally, in right of the Pope Dome, for that power belongeth to every Christian sovereign, within the bounds of his own empire, and is inseparable from the sovereignty. Before the people of Israel had, by the commandment of God to Samuel, set over themselves a king, after the manner of other nations, the high priest had the civil government. And none but he could make, nor depose an inferior priest, but that power was afterwards in the king, as may be proved by this same argument of Bellarmine. For if the priest, be he the high priest or any other, had his jurisdiction immediately from God, then the king could not take it from him. For he could do nothing contrary to God's ordinance, but it is certain that King Solomon, 1 Kings 2.26, deprived Abiathar the high priest of his office and placed Zadok, verse 35, in his room. Kings therefore may in the like manner ordain and deprive bishops as they shall think fit for the well-governing of their subjects. His sixth argument is this, if bishops have their jurisdiction de jure divino, that is, immediately from God, they that maintain it, should bring some word of God to prove it. But they can bring none. The argument is good. I have therefore nothing to say against it. But it is an argument no less good, to prove the Pope himself to have no jurisdiction in the dominion of any other prince. Lastly, he bringeth for argument, the testimony of two popes, Innocent and Leo. And I doubt not but he might have all edged, with as good reason, the testimonies of all the popes almost since s. Peter. For considering the love of power naturally implanted in mankind, whosoever were made pope, he would be tempted to uphold the same opinion. Nevertheless, they should therein but do, as innocent, and Leo did, bear witness of themselves, and therefore their witness should not be good. Of the pope's temporal power. In the fifth book he hath four conclusions. The first is, that the Pope is not Lord of all the world. The second, that the Pope is not Lord of all the Christian world. The third, that the Pope, without his own territory, has not any temporal jurisdiction directly. These three conclusions are easily granted. The fourth is, that the Pope has, in the dominions of other princes, the supreme temporal power indirectly, which is denied, unless he mean by indirectly, that he has gotten it by indirect means. Then is that also granted. But I understand that when he saith he hath it indirectly, he means that such temporal jurisdiction belongeth to him of right, but that this right is but a consequence of his pastoral authority, the which he could not exercise, unless he have the other with it, and therefore to the pastoral power, which he calls spiritual, the supreme power civil is necessarily annexed, and that thereby he hath a right to change kingdoms, giving them to one, and taking them from another when he shall think it conduces to the salvation of souls. Before I come to consider the arguments by which he would prove this doctrine, it will not be amiss to lay open the consequences of it. That princes and states that have the civil sovereignty in their several commonwealths may bethink themselves, whether it be convenient for them, and conducing to the good of their subjects, of whom they are to give an account at the day of judgment, to admit the same. When it is said, the Pope hath not, in the territories of other states, the supreme civil power directly. We are to understand, he doth not challenge it, as other civil sovereigns do, from the origin all submission thereto of those that are to be governed. For it is evident, and has already been sufficiently in this treatise demonstrated, that the right of all sovereigns is derived originally from the consent of every one of those that are to be governed. Whether they that choose him, do it for their common defense against an enemy, as when they agree amongst themselves to appoint a man, or an assembly of men to protect them. Or whether they do it, to save their lives, by submission to a conquering enemy. The Pope therefore, when he disclaimeth the supreme civil power over other states directly, denieth no more, but that his right cometh to him by that way. He saith saith not for all that, to claim it another way. And that is, without the consent of them that are to be governed, by a right given him by God, which he calleth indirectly, in his assumption to the papacy. 
but by what way soever he pretend, the power is the same. And he may, if it be granted to be his right, depose princes and states, as often as it is for the salvation of souls, that is, as often as he will. For he claimeth also the sole power to judge, whether it be to the salvation of men's souls, or not. And this is the doctrine, not only that Bellarmine here, and many other doctors teach in their sermons and books, but also that some councils have decreed, and the popes have decreed. And the popes have accordingly, when the occasion hath served them, put in practice. For the fourth council of Lateran held under Pope Innocent III in the third chap. The hereticus hath this canon. If a king at the pope's admonition, do not purge his kingdom of heretics, and being excommunicate for the same, make not satisfaction within a year. His subjects are absolved of their obedience. And the practice hereof hath been seen on divers occasions, as in the deposing of Chilperic, king of France. In the translation of the Roman Empire to Charlemagne, in the oppression of John King of England, in transferring the kingdom of Navarre. And of late years, in the league against Henry III of France, and in many more occurrences. I think there be few princes that consider not this as unjust and inconvenient, but I wish they would all resolve to be kings or subjects. Men cannot serve two masters, they ought therefore to ease them, either by holding the reins of government wholly in their own hands, or by wholly delivering them into the hands of the Pope. That such men as are willing to be obedient, may be protected in their obedience. For this distinction of temporal and spiritual power is but words. Power is as really divided, and as dangerously to all purposes, by sharing with another indirect power, as with a direct one. But to come now to his arguments. The first is this, the civil power is subject to the spiritual. Therefore he that hath the supreme power spiritual, hath right to command temporal princes, and dispose of their temporals in order to the spiritual. As for the distinction of temporal and spiritual, let us consider in what sense it may be said intelligibly, that the temporal or civil power is subject to the spiritual. There be but two ways that those words can be made sense. For when we say, one power is subject to another power, the meaning either is, that he which hath the one, is subject to him that hath the other. Or that the one power is to the other, as the means to the end. For we cannot understand, that one power hath power over another power. And that one power can have right or command over another, for subjection, command, right, and power are accidents, not of powers, but of persons. One power may be subordinate to another, as the art of a saddler, to the art of a writer. If then it be granted, that the civil government be ordained as a means to bring us to a spiritual felicity. Yet it does not follow, that if a king have the civil power, and the pope the spiritual, that therefore the king is bound to obey the pope, more than every saddler is bound to obey every writer. Therefore, as from subordination of an art, cannot be inferred the subjection of the professor, so from the subordination of a government, cannot be inferred the subjection of the governor. When therefore he saith, the civil power is subject to the spiritual, his meaning is, that the civil sovereign is subject to the spiritual sovereign. And the argument stands thus, the civil sovereign is subject to the spiritual. Therefore the spiritual prince may command temporal princes, where the conclusion is the same, with the antecedent he should have proved. But to prove it, he allegeth first, this reason, kings and popes, clergy and laity make but one commonwealth. That is to say, but one church, and in all bodies the members depend one upon another, but things spiritual depend not of things temporal, therefore, temporal depend on spiritual, and therefore are subject to them, in which argumentation there be two gross errors. One is, that all Christian kings, popes, clergy, and all other Christian men, make but one commonwealth. For it is evident that France is one commonwealth, Spain another, and Venice a third, etc. And these consist of Christians, and therefore also are several bodies of Christians. That is to say, several churches, and their several sovereigns represent them, whereby they are capable of commanding and obeying, of doing and suffering, as a natural man. Which no general or universal church is, till it have a representant. Which it hath not on earth. For if it had, there is no doubt but that all Christendom were one commonwealth, whose sovereign were that representant, both in things spiritual and temporal. And the Pope, to make himself this representant, 
one of three things that our Savior hath not given him, to command, and to judge, and to punish. Otherwise then, by excommunication, to run from those that will not learn of him. For though the Pope were Christ's only vicar, yet he cannot exercise his government, till our Savior's second coming. And then also it is not the Pope, but St. Peter himself, with the other apostles, that are to be judges of the world. The other error in this his first argument is, that he says, the members of every commonwealth, as of a natural body, depend one of another, it is true, they cohere together. But they depend only on the sovereign, which is the soul of the commonwealth. Which failing, the commonwealth is dissolved into a civil war, no one man so much as cohering to another, for one of a common dependence on a known sovereign. Just as the members of the natural body dissolve into earth, for one of a soul to hold them together. Therefore there is nothing in this similitude, from whence to infer a dependence of the laity on the clergy, or of the temporal officers on the spiritual, but of both on the civil sovereign. Which ought indeed to direct his civil commands to the salvation of souls, but is not therefore subject to any but God himself. And thus you see the labored fallacy of the first argument, to deceive such men is distinguished not between the subordination of actions and the way to the end and the subjection of persons one to another in the administration of the means. For to every end, the means are determined by nature, or by God himself supernaturally. But the power to make men use the means is in every nation resigned, by the law of nature, which forbiddeth men to violate their faith given to the civil sovereign. His second argument is this, every commonwealth, because it is supposed to be perfect and sufficient in itself, may command any other commonwealth not subject to it and force it to change the administration of the government, nay depose the prince, and set another in his room, if it cannot otherwise defend itself against the injuries he goes about to do them. Much more may a spiritual commonwealth command a temporal one to change the administration of their government, and may depose princes, and institute others, when they cannot otherwise defend the spiritual good. That a commonwealth, to defend itself against injuries, may lawfully do all that he hath here said, is very true and hath already in that which hath gone before been sufficiently demonstrated. And if it were also true, that there is now in this world a spiritual commonwealth, distinct from a civil commonwealth, then might the prince thereof, upon injury done him. Or upon one of caution that injury be not done him in time to come, repair, and secure himself by war, which is in some it, deposing, killing, or subduing, or doing any act of hostility. But by the same reason, it would be no less lawful for a civil sovereign, upon the like injuries done, or feared, to make war upon the spiritual sovereign. Which I believe is more than Cardinal Bellarmine would have inferred from his own proposition. But spiritual commonwealth there is none in this world, for it is the same thing with the kingdom of Christ, which he himself saith, is not of this world. But shall be in the next world, at the resurrection, when they that have lived justly, and believe that he was the Christ, shall, though they died natural bodies, rise spiritual bodies. And then it is, that our Savior shall judge the world, and conquer his adversaries, and make a spiritual commonwealth. In the meantime, seeing there are no men on earth, whose bodies are spiritual, there can be no spiritual commonwealth amongst men that are yet in the flesh. Unless we call preachers, that have commissioned to teach, and prepare men for their reception into the kingdom of Christ at the resurrection, a commonwealth, which I have proved to be none. The third argument is this, it is not lawful for Christians to tolerate an infidel or heretical king, in case he endeavor to draw them to his heresy or infidelity. But to judge whether a king draw his subjects to heresy or not, belongeth to the Pope. Therefore hath the Pope right, to determine whether the prince be to be deposed or not deposed. To this I answer, that both these assertions are false. For Christians, or men of what religion soever, if they tolerate not their king, whatsoever law he mocketh, though it be concerning religion, do violate their faith, contrary to the divine law. Both natural and positive, nor is there any judge of heresy among subjects, but their own civil sovereign. For heresy is nothing else, but a private opinion, obstinately maintained, contrary to the opinion which the public person, that is to say, the representative of the commonwealth, hath commanded to be taught, by which it is manifest that an opinion publicly appointed to be taught cannot be heresy, nor the sovereign princes that authorize them, heretics. For heretics are none but private men, 
that stubbornly defend some doctrine prohibited by their lawful sovereigns. But to prove that Christians are not to tolerate infidel or heretical kings, he allegeth a place in D.U.T. 17. Where God forbiddeth the Jews, when they shall set a king over themselves, to choose a stranger. And from thence inferreth, that it is unlawful for a Christian, to choose a king, that is not a Christian. And tis true, that he that is a Christian, that is, he that hath already obliged himself to receive our Savior when he shall come, for his king. Shall tempt God too much in choosing for king in this world, one that he knoweth will endeavor, both by terror, and persuasion to make him violate his faith. But it is, saith he, the same danger, to choose one that is not a Christian, for king, and not to depose him, when he is chosen. To this I say, the question is not of the danger of not deposing, but of the justice of deposing him. To choose him, may in some cases be unjust, but to depose him, when he is chosen, is in no case just. For it is always violation of faith, and consequently against the law of nature, which is the eternal law of God. Nor do we read, that any such doctrine was accounted Christian in the time of the apostles, nor in the time of the Romain emperors, till the popes had the civil sovereignty of Rome. But to this he hath replied, that the Christians of old, deposed not Nero, nor Diocletian, nor Julian, nor Valens and Arian, for this cause only, that they wanted temporal forces. Perhaps so. But did our Savior, who for calling for, might have had twelve legions of immortal, invulnerable angels to assist him, want forces to depose Caesar, or at least Pilate, that unjustly, without finding fault in him, delivered him to the Jews to be crucified? Or if the apostles wanted temporal forces to depose Nero, was it therefore necessary for them in their epistles to the new-made Christians to teach them? As they did, to obey the powers constituted over them, whereof Nero in that time was one, and that they ought to obey them, not for fear of their wrath, but for conscience' sake? Shall we say they did not only obey, but also teach what they meant not, for want of strength? It is not therefore for want of strength, but for conscience' sake, that Christians are to tolerate their heathen princes or princes, for I cannot call any one whose doctrine is the public doctrine. An heretic that authorized the teaching of an error. And whereas for the temporal power of the Pope, he allegeth further, that St. Paul, 1 cor. 6. Appointed judges under the heathen princes of those times, such as were not ordained by those princes, it is not true. For St. Paul does but advise them to take some of their brethren to compound their differences as arbitrators, rather than to go to law one with another before the heathen judges. Which is a wholesome precept, and full of charity, fit to be practiced also in the best Christian commonwealths. And for the danger that may arise to religion, by the subjects tolerating of an heathen, or an erring prince, it is a point, of which a subject is no competent judge. Or if he be, the Pope's temporal subjects may judge also of the Pope's doctrine. For every Christian prince, as I have formerly proved, is no less supreme pastor of his own subjects, than the Pope of his. The fourth argument, is taken from the baptism of kings, wherein, that they may be made Christians they submit their scepters to Christ, and promise to keep, and defend the Christian faith. This is true, for Christian kings are no more but Christ's subjects, but they may, for all that, be the Pope's fellows, for they are supreme pastors of their own subjects. And the Pope is no more but king and pastor, even in Rome itself. The fifth argument is drawn from the word spoken by our Savior, feed my sheep, by which was give all power necessary for a pastor, as the power to chase away wolves, such as are heretics. The power to shut up rams, if they be mad, or push at the other sheep with their horns, such as are evil, though Christian kings. And power to give the flock convenient food, from whence he infereth, that St. Peter had these three powers given him by Christ. To which I answer, that the last of these powers, is no more than the power, or rather command to teach. For the first, which is to chase away wolves, that is, heretics, the place he quoteth is math. 7.15 Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. But neither are heretics false prophets, or at all prophets. Nor, admitting heretics for the wolves there meant, were the apostles commanded to kill them, or if they were kings, to depose them. But to beware of, fly, and avoid them. Nor was it to St. Peter, nor to any of the apostles, but to the multitude of the Jews that followed him into the mountain, 
men for the most part not yet converted, that he gave this counsel. To beware of false prophets, which therefore if it conferred a power of chasing away kings, was given, not only to private men, but to men that were not at all Christians. And as to the power of separating and shutting up of furious rams, by which he meaneth Christian kings that refused to submit themselves to the Roman pastor. Our Savior refused to take upon him that power in this world himself, but advised to let the corn and tares grow up together till the day of judgment. Much less did he give it to St. Peter, or Canes, Peter give it to the popes. St. Peter, and all other pastors, are bidden to esteem those Christians that disobey the church, that is, that disobey the Christian sovereign, as heathen men, and as publicans. Seeing then men challenge to the Pope no authority over heathen princes, they ought to challenge none over those that are to be esteemed as heathen. But from the power to teach only, he inferreth also a coercive power in the Pope, over kings. The pastor, saith he, must give his flock convenient food, therefore the Pope may, and ought to compel kings to do their duty. Out of which it followeth, that the Pope, as pastor of Christian men, is king of kings. Which all Christian kings ought indeed either to confess, or else they ought to take upon themselves the supreme pastoral charge, every one in his own dominion. His sixth and last argument is from examples. To which I answer, first, that examples prove nothing. Secondly, that the examples he allegeth make not so much as a probability of right. The fact of Jehoiada, in killing Athaliah 2 Kings 11, was either by the authority of King Josh, or it was a horrible crime in the high priest which, ever after the election of King Saul, was a mere subject? The fact of St. Ambrose, in excommunicating Theodosius the emperor, if it were true he did so, was a capital crime. And for the popes, Gregory I, Greg, II, Zachary, and Leo III, their judgments are void, as given in their own cause, and the acts done by them conformably to this doctrine are the greatest crimes, especially that of Zachary, that are incident to humane nature and thus much of power ecclesiastical. Wherein I had been more brief, forbearing to examine these arguments of Bellarmine, if they had been his, as a private man, and not as the champion of the papacy, against all other Christian princes and states. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button, and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.